sometimes on a resume people come with um, where places where they have worked and you assume that just because they have worked in these places they and because these companies are successful then this person was instrumental for the su- success but it's not always the case so it is definitely not yeah, yeah exactly it is important to really understand where people come from and have a, a you know personal opinion and you're right due diligence is important but having said that once you get this um knowledge and the background information do trust people because you wouldn't be able i wouldn't be able to build a business if i didn't trust the you know many people around me i have been burned from people that i trusted and ended up not being um very diligent in what they're doing but also because i've trusted other people i think i i am where i am now because you need to understand that you would only grow if you have a strong team around you hello and welcome to anatomy of a leader show with me maria vorostovsky i'm the founder and ceo of hvo search founders ceos and loan hr directors hire me when they feel stuck and under pressure to hire the right senior leaders who will grow their companies. They work with me to ensure they don't hire the wrong person. I'm on a mission to discover what makes a great leader, the skills they have, what drives them, to really dissect what success looks like and what it takes to get to the very top. My aim is to bring to you leadership stories of entrepreneurs, founders, CEOs, investors, authors, leaders from all walks of life the failures they faced what they wish they knew before they started and the hurdles they had to overcome if you want to be inspired surprised and feel like you're not alone in your struggles towards the very top you're in the right place here on anatomy of a leader like and comment below and subscribe to make sure you don't miss a single episode it will change the way you think and may even change your life So, Eva, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Really welcome here and wonderful to meet you in person. Um I've been really looking forward to it because I have tried the 111 skin products and just find the the quality, the experience, sort of like how the textures feel on your skin just absolutely wonderful and opulent and just really um sort of this Uh, exuberant sort of opulent experience and you know kind of going back and reading a little bit more about the brand about how it's sort of surgically inspired how you know it's scientifically led and uh, a business that is founded by both yourself and your husband Yanis so yeah just fascinated to kind of get into it and and hear your story but before we get into the brand i'd love to find out a little bit more about your background and kind of where you come from i'm always fascinated like what's been the journey and the story so yeah would you tell us a little bit more about that thank you for having me um the journey now it's a very long journey and it has many many different facets of the story but if i can summarize it um i think my journey started way back when i was a child in in bulgaria and we lived behind the iron curtain and i had my mom traveling the world she was one of the exception to the rules because she was an air hostess and was able to visit countries that were not allowed for 99% of the population in Bulgaria. So she used to bring amazing lipsticks and very very beautiful um looking products that we didn't have. We did have products but they're all kind of standardized like everything in the communist country was quite you know more simple. Um so I was always fascinated by beauty and even my grandmother used to always put potions on her cucumber peels and oranges and she was very fascinated about being all white and lemon squeezing lemon putting on her skin so i always loved beauty and then um i i i suppose i was a little fortunate to meet someone that it is in beauty uh, my husband or i was fortunate that he found me and pursued me for a little bit <laughs> and then um when i met him he was already practicing as a plastic surgeon here in london and i was living in miami um i started coming more spending more time here and he started expressing 
some concerns to me about his business. And one of the things that he said is that um, his patients were um, reacting a little bit with the skincare that he had in his practice. He was using very, very advanced skincare from Dr. Obagi from, from the States, and he's an amazing, amazing doctor. But I think the European clients were not ready for, for um, very, very sophisticated ingredients that had a little bit of harsh effects on the skin. People here always expected to have more mild results in plastic surgery, more mild results with their skincare. So he was talking to me, he was saying, I, oh, I wish I can have something that is um, just as effective, but it has uh, on application feels a little bit better and more gentle. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the journey with uh, when I started getting involved because uh, I just heard this idea and I said to him, well, why don't you develop something that can be your own and, and you can put all your energy and effort into it. Um, so yeah, this was, it, it was just a little conversation between him and I. Mm -hmm. um, so his whole, his whole philosophy uh, in his practice is that he believes in uh, long-term effects for his clients. He's a surgeon, um, American and European board certified surgeon. And um, he, he, want, he has been in his practice for 20 years in the same space. It's not about sensational overnight results. It's very much a journey. He wants to follow his patients through the years to make sure that they have effective results, surgical or non-surgical. And the skincare was just an important addition because it, it is the last step in a way when he sees his patients. Mm -hmm. um, so let's take surgical patients, for example. He, he has to, he cuts the skin and he sees the three-dimensional healing of the skin. Then he has to remove stitches. So he has to follow how the wounds are healing. And having a topical treatment on top is so crucial because it would improve the whole process of healing of the skin. Mm -hmm. So for him, having effective products have always been on the forefront of his, of his idea how to enhance the journey. So if, when you have happy patients, they become long-term happy patients and word of mouth is very important. Plastic surgeons, usually uh, their results speak for themselves and that's how they have repeated clients. So this was this was a bit of, um, of of his story. He really wanted to to create something that enhances and helps with the healing of the skin, but he also wanted to have a product that is not harsh and that can be applied directly onto wounds and and have um, effective results without aggravating the skin. In addition to the trauma that it had already suffered, um, and he didn't have the time. So I was the person who was facilitating initially the correspondence with him and the scientists and testing and trialing. And that was a journey of maybe two to three years. Um, and then finally, we created a product that he was happy with, uh, that he was giving to his patients to heal post-surgery. And uh, that product was didn't have a price. It was just an additional benefit to make sure that the satisfaction of the clients uh, leads through to a long-term appreciation. And um, yeah, so that product is the beginning of our range. Mm, incredible, incredible story. And, you know, how the inspiration behind it and, um, and what fascinates me is, you know, when you have an idea, a concept of something that you want to kind of Put together in the world and then actually making it happen what do you think was the most challenging thing going from that sort of concept to actually then making it sort of you know be out there in the world uh, that's a very very good question because actually from the concept to being it out there in the world um, we had a bit of um, a different journey because most companies would really want to they would know their positioning and what they want to achieve for us, initially, we didn't have any idea for these products to be in a retail environment. We didn't, we didn't think that they would be sold. This was just a product to help patients heal post-surgery. Um, his patients, though, were responding so well, and they, they came to him and 
they were asking for um, additional product even when the wounds have completely healed. And when I say wounds, it's not necessarily surgical wounds. He also does quite a lot of non-surgical treatments. So he uses also, he gives the product, let's say, post thermage, fraxo, some laser resurfacing. So a lot of the products, were, people were coming and saying, can I have a little more? Or do you have something that, can I use it on the eye? And can I start, uh, start using it as my day cream? Because they were really impressed with the health of the skin. So for us, it, it was, um, we were a little bit uh, unprepared with uh, the, the future that laid ahead of us right. because we were not, we didn't have the concept and we didn't start with this grand idea that we would have a skincare brand that it would go global and we would be in retail environments around the world, in beautiful stores, now in beautiful spas. So everything was, it was a, a long journey, a difficult journey. Uh, we had to learn along the way, um, and I think probably a little bit of luck really helped. We were fortunate that Harrods came to us, and they wanted they were expanding their doctor brand selections, and they were really looking for a scientific brand to go alongside some of the existing more long term brands that they had. So they approached us, and they. Uh, tried the products for an extended period of time and then one day they called and said we're launching the brand so in a sense I think we we, we did have a, a beautiful product we did have a, a, an amazing concept but then also having Harrods as your platform mm -hmm. definitely helped us long term to have a bit more visibility uh, but you do have to you you cannot um, be successful if you don't have the science right so i think we are very fortunate that we had yanis who was in who is a practicing plastic surgeon very involved in the medical field working on on very specific ingredients for specific purposes and then from there the brand was able to to accept to have a global acceptance so you're talking about kind of harrods being you know, quite quite critical in this in this moment for you. Was that the pivotal moment where you felt that that was the kind of the turning point for the brand, and all of a sudden you're kind of on a on a in a different level, being more visible as a brand rather than a product that's you know being served to the customers in the you know in the surgery and post uh, post surgeries. Well, definitely with uh, the possibility to launch in a retail environment, we had to start thinking. <clears throat> a bit more in a um, professional way of how we look, how is our packaging. Prior to that, we had very simple medicinal bottles in the clinic. Um, so we had to think a little bit about our positioning. Even, I believe, in, in our clinic, we didn't even have the brand name. So when we, when we were launching in Harrods, that was one of the questions. They said, we love the product. What is the brand name? Mm -hmm. So we actually came back and started brainstorming a little bit, and we came with a very very unique um, name, which is our Harley Street address. And, you know, people received it very well. So, yeah, that was a point where we had to think, OK, now we are more on a retail environment. We, we, we need to think of how we look. And I think this was probably my contribution to the brand because everything to do with uh, formulation and concept is Yanis. Um, being a doctor, I really don't want to interfere in his knowledge and understanding of, of three-dimensional healing of the skin and what the skin needs. Um, however, when it comes to packaging, more the sensorial feeling of the products, the scent, I think this is my contribution because for me was having that background, remembering my childhood with my mom always bringing something that looked not just felt good, but also looked good was really important for me. I wanted to, if the brand, I wanted the brand to be what it is, which is you know, surgical precision ingredients and really help with the healing, but I wanted to look beautiful. Mm -hmm. It was it was uh, important to me what kind of feeling the brand elicits when someone touches and feels the product and applies the product. Because from a very young age, for me, um, because I didn't have access to huge amounts of cosmetics and, um, and products, uh, every time I, I smelled or I touched the lipstick, that my mom would bring from the Western world was, I just remember the experience. Mm -hmm. 
So for me, every single product that I ever have, I really appreciate it because it just delicious these emotions when I was younger. So I remember I, it's very the sensorial part of the smell, the touch, and also you with your skincare, sometimes it's different with makeup because you use brushes. But with skincare, you usually touch yourself with, mm -hmm. with your fingers. It's very, very tactile. It's very personal. Um, and I wanted that emotion to really elicit a sense of confidence and joy. And I was working very, very closely with Yanis on, on the development of the formula. You describe it so well that I want to like rush out and get more of the um, of the masks, which is the product that I tried, and put that on again because it just sounds like such a wonderful experience. And it was when I when I did that. Um, what is the future of, of of the brand now? What are the kind of like the challenges that lie ahead, and what are you hoping to achieve? Um, the future of the brand is very, very similar to what we're doing now. I am very much um, a believer in growing in a steady, sustainable fashion. Um, so a few years from now, I want us to be doing exactly what we're doing now, uh, just doing it better. Um, so if I look at our global footprint, for example, we are probably in, in most of the places we want to be. We are in beautiful locations in London, in New York, uh, Saks Fifth Avenue, Neiman Marcus, Netta Porte, Violet Grey. Um, and uh, I don't necessarily want to capture more presence in our retail world because I believe we are already in the right places. The, where I want to venture is into spa and experiential treatments. It's, um, I feel very, very fortunate that we are one of these brands that is able to do that. We have a long history of treatment in the clinic. Yanis is um, a plastic surgeon, but he's also doing non-surgical treatments for the last 21 years. And we were able to pivot quite quickly into creating uh, treatment menus in our stores, in places like Harrods, um, Saks Fifth Avenue, Neiman Marcus. So, it's um, the brand was very much um, being trialed and tested with clients on the retail floor through treatments. And now in the last two, three years, we had a lot of requests from spas to um, establish some presence with one on one skin. And we were very well positioned because we already had all these protocols that we have been developing over the years. And this is very much the, the direction. I believe that beauty has to be experienced, mm -hmm. um, not just someone telling you on the shop floor what's good for you. It's very, very important to be immersed in, in our universe of what we consider to be one one skin. And it's very much about, um, it's our lifestyle as well. It's, the, uh, it's not just the products, it's the treatments. It's, we also have cryo chambers, mm -hmm. which are very much about wellness. So we want to have the same way Yanis has his journey with his clients from long term, for many, many years. Sometimes he has families that they bring, you know, their children come to him. And I want to have the same experience with the skincare. I want to be able to, um, you know, um, experience somebody to experience this in a spa treatment with their daughters with their mothers with their best friend I want the brand to have this kind of longevity and elicit emotions in people that's very exciting and also coming out hopefully coming out of this sort of pandemic you know world where we have been you know pr pretty predominantly doing kind of treatments at home and in my opinion sort of desperate for that social contact or being with people having an experience that's beyond your four walls i feel that that's um really needed uh, to have that experience and when you're talking about bringing your your daughters or your mothers or your friends and having that i think it's absolutely what we were craving for right now do you feel that the pandemic has changed your way of thinking i mean it sounds like you have already been you know, you've already been focused on that before. You understand what it's like to work with, you know, patients and, you know, and, and customers on a one-on-one -on -one, on -one basis. But has the pandemic changed any way of thinking or the focus in any way? 
I think as like so many other brands, of course, we had to pivot towards more digital strategy and we worked really, really hard to make sure that we are still there for our for our clients to em- embrace the journey with them and to be an, of an assistant assistance because most of our shops were closed. So we immediately um, put a lot of our salespeople to do online virtual consultations so we can continue that personal communication with clients. It's not just about selling a product. It's very much understanding what product they need versus just giving them something that they need to buy. So we we were able to do that. Um, However, I have to say that I'm very, very happy that our shops are opening uh, for us, we started in a, in in non digital environment. We we were, as I said, we were a clinic clinical brand with no retail in the for the first five years of our existence. Then we moved into physical retail, and that's how we actually built our brand. It wasn't on the digital sphere with you know advertising digitally. It was really one client at a time coming to us, giving testers, educating people about the brand. So I am I I I am definitely as a brand, our strategy, and I've been asked many times even by our team if we're gonna exit some of our retail places. And I am definitely supporting retail. I'm I am putting a lot of effort and focus because um they gave us our presence and I really want to make sure that we have a balanced existence. We have digital, but also very much strong place where we can communicate properly mm-hmm. with clients. And that's where SPA comes as, as kind of like the last frontier for us because it is having these scientific rituals in SPAs where you can immerse every client into the experience of, of who we are as a brand. And it's so, so, so important. Mm, just having that real connection with with your customer with the people who you're serving and sort of you know really giving that that amazing as you said immersive experience what would you say would be your secrets to success (laughs) um if you have any secrets to success share with me please (laughs) (laughs) i would i um look success comes in so many different ways to so many people and um for me it's Success is balancing work and personal life and understanding how you can, you know, create this environment where you don't, when you're at work, you don't feel like you're missing something at home. And when you're at home, you don't feel like you should really be working. So finding that balance. But if you, if you're asking me about the success of one one skin, I, I would say that it is a lot of work. It's very hard work. Um, and you need to really be prepared to spend many, many hours and to just be able to face the challenges and, and keep, um, keep, keep staying focused on who you are as a brand. Mm-hmm. I think if I have to give advice to, to people that are starting now, it's just really not look at competitors, not look what everybody is doing, not necessarily f- Look at the trends, absolutely, but don't follow every trend. Like understand the core, what is true to you, understand who you are. And and for me from the beginning, it was very, very clear. We were a surgical brand. We we have a doctor. All of our inspiration comes from from the clinic and from the medical field. But I was also, this was 10 years ago, I I was believing in having sustainable packaging, sustainable resources. I remember I sourced a very, very expensive glass jar from Italy when I could barely afford this. But it was very important to me because I I knew that glass was the most abundant resource. Now, if we fast forward 10 years down the road, sustainability is crucial, but it wasn't way, way back then. It was just important to me. So I think success it it would really help everyone if they understand what they stand for and kind of stay true to their beliefs. And then success would come if you work really hard. One of the best pieces of advice that I have been given is to stay in your own lane, which to me at the beginning just sounded like, well, you know, just like being your own place kind of thing. But, you know, as I matured and 
got a little bit wiser. It's it's exactly what you're saying about, you know, sure, look at the competitors, see what, you know, other people are doing. But if you don't know what your specific lane is, what, you know, your purpose, your, you know, your vision, your ideas, you know, what makes you special um, and stick to that rather than constantly being kind of swayed into whatever direction that, I mean, you know, the next is- trend goes it's it's a hundred percent uh it's it's so it's such a valid valid point because i even remember having one buyer from a very big department store that told me you know now it's this trend with organic is coming and you know i'm not sure that the scientific brands you know are going to have a place anymore and it, it to me you know this we are a scientific brand we had to do what we wanted to do for the industry it's in I, I didn't go and change all of my ingredients to all of a sudden become an organic brand it just you know you have to be there's a space for everyone and i think if you start following all the trends then you would lose the core of of who you are i i have also another story where when we launched our masks um also another very very important buyer from a uh, from a big store uh, told us that uh, they don't believe in this category, that masking is not here to stay, it's just a trend. So that was actually the opposite of what we're discussing. I, I actually had to fight and, and and not fight with them, but I really wanted to launch to launch them. And I believe that this is a long-term trend. And I definitely believed in the validity of masks as a category because the, the way we launch mask is it was derived from a medical technology, we launch biocellulose, which is used for wound healing. So we approached it in a very medical way. And I'm very lucky that now mask is uh, a category that is very much part of everybody's regime. But I had to fight for this space. Mm-hmm. So it is It just, you know, don't listen to... I mean, you can listen to people from the industry, you can take advice, but ultimately you have to know in your heart what's mm-hmm. right for you. Or to listen to your own gut as well. Yeah. You were saying earlier about um, this idea of balance of, you know, when you're at home that you're, you know, fully present and you're kind of like not thinking of of work and vice versa when you're at work that you're not worried about home. How do you achieve that balance? Like what's what's the secret to that? (laughs) I want to know this for myself. (laughs) Um, First, I'm going to make a disclosure that there are going to be times in your life when you start your business or even when you you run your business there's going to be these extreme times where this balance is not going to be uh, possible and that's what you have to do as an entrepreneur you just have to fight through some difficult moments and they are difficult moments and all of us have them but overall I think I um, my secret is that I have a relatively well manage perception of how much time I want to spend with my children and how much time I want to be at work and then it's 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 kind of like my golden rule that I I carve that time out and it it has worked for me over the last 10 years I've had babies when I started my company and now I have teenagers Um, so my morning routine is always with the family um, and I and my evening routine is always with them. And actually, it really works for my family because they are my children are also they're at school, they're very busy, they have sports. So we all carve these periods where we are together. And, and it's uh, absolutely no exception to the rules. My children know when it's dinner time, they have to be at dinner. Uh, on the weekends, we go together, we have lunches, we run together in the park, we oh, walk so the dog, nice. we, we just, they yeah. know that they have to do things. Mm-hmm. And I mean, now I have a teenager, so he's checking every <laughs> minute how long, how many more minutes I have to be with my mom and dad. But, mm-hmm. you know, he plays his schedule around it. So, and also I have my quality time with my husband, which is, I, I think I'm so, so fortunate because we don't really work together. He has his surgical practice. I have a different office. But when we travel for business, usually he's required. And then I, because I run the company, I also have to be there. So uh, clients want to meet him, but uh, the business people behind the accounts need to spend time with me. So we always um, go and, let's say, visit uh, different places. And then we carve out a day or two and we have an extended holiday. So if if it happens to be San Francisco, for example, we would go to Napa Valley Mm -hmm. 
and and take a day after we've done all the press days and we visited all the shops and we've done all the trainings um but on on a normal day i just we all wake up together the whole family it's a mad house at seven in the morning okay, um, imagine yeah <laughs> but we're all sitting and we're mm-hmm. chatting and and this is actually you know it's this is the time when you can really have your children because they're not preoccupied from the day existence and they're there and you know they're relatively sleepy but they're chatting and you know you can have a normal conversation with them yeah I think structuring time I interviewed Nir Eyal who talks a lot about um, time boxing he's an author of Hooked and Indistractable and he's a behavioral scientist and created sort of tech products and written books about how to do that and he talks a lot about time boxing scheduling like whatever is important to you then then you put it into your diary and that sort of stays there and I think you're kind of embodying that that advice and I think it's so easy to just kind of be in the in the moment and doing things but actually having like more structure and saying this is you know this is in here and I have to do this and um and not compromise on that I mean as you said for sure there'll be moments when when you can't do that but on the whole and then your kids know and when they're teenagers it's like but we've been doing this all (laughs) all these years you can't escape it yeah no it's important and also uh, if you you have to know your kind of rhythm of when for example I don't start work before 10 just because this is what works for me I I work from 10 to 6 some people work from 7 to 5 and they need the afternoon but for me from 7 to 10 it just it, it is my personal time and it's so so important because it is the breakfast then I work out with my husband if he's not in surgery then I have my own time my own rituals and and it it is it it's a you know it's my personal space and time and I don't like people breaking in taking time away from that because then I also have a very long day and I and everybody around me my office knows my friends know that this is kind of you know don't ask Eva to come at eight o'clock somewhere because I am running in the park and I love running so it is my routine and I yeah I try well, you take to care of yourself as well and you know there's so many demands on you know, founders and people in business and on the individual that if you don't take the time to take care of yourself, then you're just sort of spent and you don't have no, that much to give. No, you cannot just keep saying, oh, tomorrow, the day after, I'll start something else tomorrow. We we don't, I, you have to allocate the time. And one, one funny example is we actually do a dance class with my husband on, on Sundays. That's amazing. And it, Trying to know, get my husband to do that. <laughs> well, it, I... If you had asked Yanis, if you had told Yanis that he'll be dancing, Latin dancing in a group <laughs> with, you know, four other guys, and he, he would have said impossible. I mean, he's not the type, but then it's so invigorating and it's so fun. And at the same time, it's a workout. So it's important that the guys understand that dancing is a workout. It's not just for, um, you know, stretching. So he he comes. We love this. And, and it's, it's very... It's a very important thing because we're bonding on a different level and I, I, I just, I like doing it and I wouldn't want to change it. Mm. Definitely. Whatever's important to you, you have to find time for it because otherwise you just never get around to it. And, um, you know, there's no, no such thing as like, oh, I don't have time. It's like whatever, you know, we're always stretched. Yeah. So you have to carve time. You have to make time for those important things. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to teach my um, my employees as well, the people that work for me. Sometimes we are, now it's an exceptionally busy time. So we're all working extremely hard. It's post-COVID. Everybody's coming back to the office. It's We're not used to working together in the office. It's loud and it's chaotic. Um, and everybody you know stays late they want to finish their work because now you have time to chit chat you have time to see your friends then you also have to do your work and also we we are expanding very rapidly so there is a lot more work so sometimes I'm, I have to tell them we're in the skincare business we're not you know we it's okay like we can just finish on time and start tomorrow morning again it's not it we, there shouldn't be enormous sense of urgency and I, I want to get to this mentality that it's it's we need to prioritize what's important and still have quality of life and 
hopefully we'll get to this point. We're not there yet. <laughs> we are it's working a work like in progress. maniacs, mm. but um, mm. that's at least we have a goal mm. where we want to where we want to be. But yeah, prioritizing it's um, it's crucial. Talking about leading teams, what does leadership mean to you? I am uh, still learning how to be a leader. Uh, I hope I am a good leader. I think for me, what is important is that you empower people to to enjoy what they're doing. You want to, I want to get to this level where I I lead the right group of people that feel confident in what they're doing. They're very skillful, but also I don't have to micromanage them. I want to create this kind of hub where knowledge and energy is running together and everybody's contributing towards a common goal and we're growing rather than managing you know, people's time and tasks. And so this is, it's a very, very, a, it's not an easy, it, you need to find your people, you need to find your tribe, you need to find people that you trust because it's sharing ideas together and learning from one another. Um, so I, I, I suppose for me, leadership is really working, empowering people. So you work together towards a common goal versus having a group of people that you want to tell them what to do. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, it's challenging. It's not easy to find the right people to stimulate them the right way to let them shine and and to grow in the same direction together Mm. i think i mean coming from a recruitment background and you know knowing where you know what to look for and having knowing how the right people can make such a huge impact on your business but also um you know when people don't work out for whatever reason how difficult that would be as well um but um the other point that you mentioned about leadership is you know saying well i'm still learning to be a leader and i i always you know talk when i talk about this topic um it's like leadership is everywhere it's in all of us and you know sometimes you come to it when you're very young sometimes you're you know in a position of leadership by default or you step into a role and you know some but it's something that we learn throughout our lives it, there's you know the, the the job of a leader is never finished you never arrive and it's like oh i've arrived and now i am this fully kind of fledged leader um but it's a it's a journey so it's, well, it's, it's a constant yeah that. i mean look it's constantly evolving and you know leadership doesn't stop at your company it's also what kind of what kind of example do you want to show to your children or what kind of example you want to show even to your clients it's how what you create is in a sense you know showing who you are so it's 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 a continuous journey of self-improvement you always have to think of you have to step out and think what is the best for of course you want the company to be successful but it has to be sustainable success sustainably successful and then you need to look at the the end user so what does what is the experience that this end user wants to create so you have to embody all of these ideas into your team for them to understand that this is not just one task or certain jobs that they're doing it's how are we changing the perception through our business and i think this is the difficult part of of being a leader because you have to constantly you have to constantly remind yourself that whatever you're doing is impacting so many people. We're selling products and some, maybe millions of people are buying our products. And then in a sense, you need to have this accountability as a leader, what you're doing, because your actions have a long-term impact in somewhere in the world and in the business. So it's, uh, it can be a lot of responsibility. Um, and I think also you have to be humble and at some point to know what your limitations are and you have to surround yourself with talented people that lack your skills. Um, and I think I have definitely reached the point where, um, I mean, I've always relied on my team heavily, heavily, but I think now even more so I understand when you get to a certain level, 10 million, 20 million plus, you need very, very strong finance team, operations team 
And that's something that you have to welcome people into your world and allow them to contribute ideas of how to run a business. So I love talking to women in business and female founders. Um, what has been the biggest challenge for you being a woman in business? Um, I don't I don't have many challenges being a woman in business. I think I've always I was very, very happy uh, standing my own ground. Um, I don't I have not faced that many difficulties with uh, I think being in the beauty industry. Um, it's probably the right place for women to grow and to shine. Um, I think definitely there's no I, I don't want to talk about challenges, but I want to talk about the benefits for me being a, a female founder is that I can empower so many other female founders to do what they're doing. And I also I can empower my team to really um, have the confidence to rise up to very, very key positions in the company. Because um, from what I have heard in the industry, there's a lot of brands out there that are run by men in a boardroom and decisions are made of you know, what products need to be launched or how they need to look. And for me, it has been crucial to have... Actually, my whole management team is female only, apart from Yanis, <laughs> who is very, very instrumental because he's very much part of all the science and the development. Um, every head of my department is female. I have my ha finance is run by a lady and actually the full finance team is just ladies. I think it's seven of them. Um, and, you know, it brings a bit more humility to what we're doing and... And I love to be able to sit across the room with all of them um, and discuss not just the topics that are relevant in their departments, but just the overall direction of the company. And it's um, it, it's it, it has been very powerful for me to to hear, especially when we are discussing um, now everything that's happening in the industry with diversity with um, even on the sustainability front, it's so important, it's as important to them as it is for me. So it it's, has been an amazing um, kind of network, power network that we, we run the company together um, and, and I love it. So what advice would you give your younger self? Well, three pieces of advice, like looking back now. Um, let's see. It's interesting because sometimes people ask me what would you change uh, I wouldn't change that much um, but advice would be just um, don't be afraid of hard work um, I think it's um, it's 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 important you know with with hard work there comes a lot of rewards mm -hmm. uh, but you need to be putting the time um, I would say another advice is that I'm glad that my mom gave me that advice to also start a family and have a family and be able to do this simultaneously. Because I think I, I'm asked this question a lot, you know, do you, is it challenging to start a business when you have a s small children and, or even discussing family? And I think you can do both. We are, women are so powerful and so able to do so many things. And I think actually, being able to do to have a family and business, it's um, it even brings more strength, more creativity, more passion in everything we do. Um, and oh, what other advice? Probably be a bit more diligent with um, you know not trusting everyone. I think over the years I've um, always kind of. Um, I never felt 100% confident that I know so many things in the beauty industry because I was a newcomer. This was not my profession before uh, I started One One Skin. So I always relied heavily on people around me. And I haven't, in the beginning, I didn't really check references in a way that I should have. So I think that that's one advice. I think it's important when you're starting something or when you meet new people and you associate with people, it's important. Now it's much easier than before. You can just re properly check references and they're not just, you know, reference that you would get from an agency, but also try to really understand mm. 
where people come from, what what has been their previous experience, and you know, do this kind of test to yourself uh, to make sure. And because the the word of other people is, is quite important. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's building a fuller picture of you know an individual or whoever you're bringing into the team and having you know another you know perspective because you know quite often you know let's just face it we all have some you know internal biases and quite often we also look for people who on the surface are similar to us and if you're a really trusting person or if you're really um you know or, or you have a certain way of of, of doing things you immediately assume other people are the same and just as you said doing that due diligence is it can you know see a different angle see a different perspective and 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 to make you feel more at peace that you know you know you're, you're really getting the right person on board yeah and and you, it's exactly what you said you're absolutely right sometimes on a resume people come with um where places where they have worked and you assume that just because they have worked in these places they and because these companies are successful then this person mm -hmm. was instrumental for the su success but it's not always the case so it is definitely not yeah, yeah exactly it is important to really understand where people come from and have a, a you know personal opinion and you're right due diligence is important but having said that once you get this um knowledge and the background information do trust people because you wouldn't be able i wouldn't be able to build a business if i didn't trust the you know many people around me i have been burned from people that i trusted and ended up not being um, very diligent in what they're doing but also because I've trusted other people I think I, I am where I am now because you need to understand that you would only grow if you have a strong team around you. Yeah I think you know this idea of, of trust is you know you're always balancing the opposite ends aren't you so you know on the one hand you want to you know be safe and you know have all of the checks and balances and you know do all of your your tests but then once that's there that you know you have full autonomy and responsibility and you can just you know um, allow the person to to do what they need to do so um yeah so it's a little bit you finding the right right balance yeah one, once once you you earn or this person earns your trust then let them shine and let them be and let them really feel comfortable to contribute ideas and and to feel very comfortable in in sharing their experiences and expertise because no brands are built by one person you really it needs to be an effort that it's people are freely contributing so it is i i, I think you know yeah the people that earn you earn your trust then definitely let them thrive and and understand that it takes a group of people to run a successful company and if something tells you if, if you have a gut feeling that something is not right then definitely you know do more investigation do more due diligence and really try to understand the reasons why you might feel a little bit of mistrust somewhere and mm -hmm. and try to investigate no for sure and last but most important question what is your skincare routine <laughs> <laughs> my skincare routine is always evolving um, first of all I have to keep testing different products mm. so it's it's very hard for me to stick to to even to routines that I love I always have to add something new that we're working on and see how it mixes and matches with other products uh, but apart from that I I would always cleanse in in the morning and in the evening um, I love vitamin C cleanser uh, I would then use an essence. It's an integral part of my regime. I, if I run out of an essence, I definitely, I, I can feel it. I, I have this anxious feeling that, you know, my skin is not going to, to make it through the day in a healthy way. Um, so essence, and then I love a serum. A serum is um, has a different more, molecular um, level of penetration than cream so it's for me it's very very important um, and then because I am now as a few days ago 46 uh, in my 40s I definitely um, use a, a cream and a moisturizer because it's just my skin is is a little bit thinner and it needs a lot more 
ingredients because after a certain age you have less hyaluronic acid um, you you need to supplement so I use a very very strong um, night cream and I love to do masks I love our sheet masks I you if you come to my house I'll probably open the door in a sheet mask <laughs> I watch football games uh, with my kids I even wore a mask when we went to a football game in, at the <laughs> final of some very important game in Portugal because it was blue and it was Chelsea so I wore mask under my sunglasses so I, I love they're just a great way of creating a ritual to yourself um, and you know they're easy because they can be used on the go mm. so yeah if you can name one of your just one of your favorite products what is that it's a hundred percent our white serum repair serum mm -hmm. this was uh, our dramatic healing serum product that we originally launched in the in the clinic that we were giving to patients to to enhance their healing uh, then that's the reason why we launched in a retail environment it was the first product that people were talking in the industry and they loved it and they were demanding that this product launches uh, but i also it's because it's it's a kind of healing the invisible damage of the skin it's everyday healing of the skin it's um it really helps with i have used it on my children when they have cuts i have used it on my father when he had dermatitis so it's one of these products that it's for healing not just the skin but also any condition so it is very very much a multitasking product that um, i love using Amazing. and sharing <laughs> Well, Eva, thank you so much for coming onto the show. I'm going to go now and order some products online. Um, but it's been such a pleasure to meet you and to get to know you. And yeah, really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here on Anatomy of a Leader. I hope our guest leadership journeys resonate with you and make you feel like you too can take on the world. Please subscribe so you can be alerted when new episodes are released. Comment, like, tell a friend, share on social media. I'll make sure to support you there as well. And let me know what inspired you, the changes that you've made, and how you too succeeded against all odds. You can find me on Instagram and LinkedIn with the handle MariaHVO, or just search for my very long surname. And if you're hiring leaders to take your business to the next level, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Again, that long surname. Thank you again for being here on Anatomy of a Leader. Bye for now.